Thank you all for attending this Global Tech webinar on the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. My name is Simon Bush and I'm the CEO of the AAA. It's an absolute pleasure to host these informative webinars with our valued partners at Austrade. We have great registration numbers today uh, for this webinar. Uh, so the market uh, in question, UAE, Saudi and Qatar must be of enormous interest. Um, this event is also being recorded. Um, let us begin today by recognising the tens of thousands of years of innovation that have been handed down through the generations from the original custodians of the lands we meet today, those of us in Australia, of course. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians and owners of the land on which we meet. As I said, for me here in Canberra, it's the Ngunnawal people, and also pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, just in terms of some housekeeping, um, there is a Slido app being used. There is a code there on the screen feel free to uh, scan that, or you can simply go to slido.com in your browser. It is how Q&A will be done today. So please take the time to, to go in there. And the, and the code is hashtag global tech. It's now my pleasure to hand over to, to Marnie Stevens to give the welcome from Austrade, noting this is the last of the series of global tech webinars the AWA has partnered with Austrade on. And it's been a fantastic series. And indeed, we're going out with a massive bang today. Over to you, Marnie. Absolutely agree. Thank you, Simon. And uh, hello, uh, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. And welcome to today's webinar. My name is Marnie. Uh, I'm from the tech sector team here at Austrade, and I am so thrilled to welcome you all to, to today's webinar. We have been so proud to partner with AIIA and Simon and the team to host nine successful global tech webinars so far, which have featured some of the most exciting and emerging markets for Australian tech exporters. Those uh, webinars so far have featured uh, markets across Asia, uh, but today as a special and final webinar in the series, we are venturing a little broader to the Gulf Corporation Council countries, and in particular, focusing in on opportunities in the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. GCC countries are rapidly implementing new technologies and new business models to accommodate uh, digital transformation across all industries. This digitalization is meaning uh, that organizations and consumers are spending more on technology, which of course presents an incredible opportunity for our Australian tech businesses to tap into. So I'm really keen to hear more about this region. So to lead today's session, I'll now pass to uh, Mr. Munir Sankari, uh, Deputy Council General and Trade Commissioner in Dubai. Thanks, Munir. Thank you, Mani. It's a pleasure uh, to join you here today uh, on the margins of the World Government Summit that is being hosted in Dubai. Uh, the World Government Summit is, of course, a gathering of global leaders uh, here in the country um, with the very relevant theme of shaping of future governments. And given that we will be talking about technology today uh, with a number of our uh, speakers, uh, we just wanted to make sure that it is relevant and it is uh, consistent with the messaging that we will be uh, sharing today. Uh, just to start off with a little bit of a context of uh, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia and Qatar, and particularly the GCC, where uh, some of our uh, colleagues may, may not think of the GCC as a tech uh, hub or as a potential uh, tech opportunity, um, purely because of the uh, previous reliance on the hydrocarbons. However, there has been a number of uh, trends that have impacted on this region, and particularly around economic diversification and economic visions, such as uh, Saudi Vision 2030, UAE Vision uh, 2070, and Qatar 2030 as well, where they are looking to move away from the hydrocarbons into more uh, sustainable uh, industries and long term uh, to achieve long term growth as well. The second trend that is shaping this region is the connectivity and that hub uh, for the Middle East Africa, but also increasingly with the CIS Europe and Asia. So we have seen a number of these developments over the last uh, five to seven years, uh, where the focus and the, the hub as a doing business platform has shifted towards this region for a number of reasons that we will also cover today, uh, but primarily because of the um, regulatory 
facilitation that has been uh, undertaken uh, in terms of doing business here. And then the third element is tech as a cross sector uh, uh, approach. So we are looking at uh, tech across education um, in this region, uh, particularly when it comes to remote areas and connectivity. Uh, there is a strong focus on food security. So food tech and agri tech, uh, particularly around uh, the packaging and to ensure the sources of protein for the region as well. Um, and of course, looking at uh, emerging sectors such as new energy, hydrogen, and other capabilities, and that tech uh, uh, element as well. From a regional perspective, uh, we do see uh, quite a strong focus, and particularly in Qatar, Saudi, and the United Arab Emirates, on implementation and being a lead on implementation uh, for certain technologies. And this is why it's a fantastic opportunity to hear today on what these countries are working on to facilitate and to be able to leverage uh, these regulatory changes to be able to come in and test the technology, uh, connect with the ecosystem and the stakeholders and being able to uh, promote uh, Australian capabilities. Before I introduce the speakers for today and run through the agenda, I just wanted to highlight the Austrian support here and working closely, of course, with AIIA to be able to leverage all the stakeholders that you have here on the ground. By that, uh, for example, looking at some of the Australian universities that are based here, looking at case studies, looking at pilot projects, please reach out to us and there will be a Slido that we can take some more questions uh, towards the end of this session. But I just wanted to make sure that everyone is across the level of support that is available and the stakeholders that are available here uh, to be able to promote the training capabilities. Without any delay, I would like now to uh, introduce uh, Ms. Latifa Ben Haidar, the founder at Baituki. Latifa is a social entrepreneur, co-founder of Mental Health AE, founder of Baituki and of Baituki Academy. She is passionate and motivated about putting her skills to use for the enhancement, betterment and service of her community. This is what pushed her to create her startups, Mental Health AE and Baituki. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Business Administration from the American University of Sharjah, where she majored in business management and minored in finance. Thank you, Latifa. Thank you, Munir, for this humbling introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm honored to be speaking to all of you here today. Um, as Mr. Munir said, I am the founder of Baytuki, um, co-founder of Mensa Hafei, and I'm a passionate individual about putting my skills to use for the betterment of my community. And today I'll be talking about Baytuki. Baytuki is a crowdfunding platform that enables women towards financial prosperity through micro investments in real estate. It is licensed in the DIFC, the Dubai International Financial Center, and is registered and regulated by Dubai Financial Services Authority. And the word Baytuki means your home and it's addressing a female in the Arabic language. So what do we do with Baytuki? We source and vet properties to, to provide our clients with the best investment opportunities. They get listed on our platform without, with all the information, reports, and calculations to provide our clients with the best, apologies for that, <laughs> to provide our clients with the best investment opportunities so they can make an informed decision. Once a property gets fully funded, we complete all the purchase processes and provide the clients with all the official ownership documents. And then we manage the investment thereafter for three to five years and distribute the rental income to the investors. And at the end, we facilitate the sale of the property. So they can own fractions of different properties with Baytuki, providing them with a diversified portfolio. So this makes Baytuki a one-stop shop for real estate investors. I spoke to thousands of women while working on this project. And here are the most common reasons why they couldn't start their investment journeys. First of all, the lack of sufficient funds. A real estate investment is a big financial commitment to most, and most are not able to buy it out at once. 
therefore I must commit to monthly payments to become a property owner. Second of all, if somebody wants to invest in a property following the traditional model, they'd have to invest a lot of time and effort to collect quality data to be able to make an informed decision. Third, little knowledge or experience. Many of the women I interviewed had said that because of the lack of experience or financial literacy, they completely discounted the idea of investing in real estate altogether. And finally, little female representation in the industry. These women have also said that when they hear the word investment or real estate, an image of a man in a suit pops up and it automatically feels like it's not a space for them, but that it's intimidating to approach. So basically removed all these common barriers uh, to enable the everyday woman to invest in real estate. So how? For the lack of sufficient funds, Beituki enables women to start with as little as 5,000 dirhams and own a fraction of the property. It can be 5,000, it can be 50,000, it's totally up to you. You then receive your portion of the rental income uh, and later from the sale of the property. As for the lack of sufficient time, investing with Beituki is completely digital and hassle-free. You simply click invest and once you find the property, um, once, a pro once you find a property that you like. As for the lack of experience or knowledge, Beituki does not require its clients to have prior experience. With each property, we provide you with information, reports, and calculations that are comprehensible to most. This means that every investment you make, that with every investment you make, you build your experience and knowledge. We also provide free educational sessions on personal money management so that our clients not only become real estate owners, but also become more financially literate. Finally, for female representation, we host frequent educational sessions and events for our clients, providing them with a supportive and relatable environment to ask all their questions and meet other women in the industry, including our team members who are coincidentally all female. Right. So before listing a property for a client, a lot of time consuming work and research needs to be done. And quality data comes at a cost. I look at prop, uh, prop, popular property websites in the UAE, such as Property Finder, Bayut, Dubizil, and others, or even the big property developers such as Amar, Dama, Kazizi. And I constantly find that tremendous efforts are needed just to collect and understand basic information. And I keep thinking, with all the tech that we have today, why is this data not available? So while putting this presentation together, I was thinking about exactly what software or service providers I would need as Bay2Key to be more productive at what I do. The use of technology in, in the real estate market, such as virtual and augmented reality, can enhance the customer experience and help showcase properties in a unique and interactive way. The benefits are that we don't have to engage, nor do we have to book viewings, and we can have thousands using the same tool at the same time. And since we facilitate the buying and the selling for our clients, we will definitely be benefiting from online service providers that can help connect real estate developers with potential buyers and renters, making it easier to market and sell properties. Provide predictive analysis that can be used to analyze data on past sales and rental prices, helping developers make strategic decisions about pricing and marketing strategies. An AI-powered property management software that can automate tasks such as rent collection and maintenance scheduling. So if you ask anyone in the, in the industry, specifically property managers, you'll know that it's a source of headache, especially if you're managing properties for a big number of clients. Finally, AI-powered chatbots to handle basic customer increase, and the benefits would be quick and accurate responses, 24-7 uh, customer support that reduced the need for live customer service agents, uh, resulting in cost savings for businesses. And finally, chatbots can help businesses capture valuable customer data, which can be used to improve customer experience and better understand customer needs. Now, there are a lot of entities or startups doing similar things to what I just mentioned, but there's still not enough and there's room for more. So going back to the title of my talk, how will Beituki build the future of fractional ownership in real estate? We all know the advancements that are happening in the new tech, such as AI and blockchain. They're great tools and create opportunity. However, 
we have issues surrounding KYC and AML checks, which require regulatory oversight and control. And in the UAE, we are regulated by Dubai Financial Services Authority. The opportunity would be to find or build a global platform that is acceptable to regional or local regulators. A global platform that runs KYC and AML checks and verifies individuals or entities. This would allow companies like Beituki or any regulated entity that has this regulatory requirement to simply connect to the platforms and, not, and allow users to invest and swap ownership from anywhere around the world, therefore enabling, enabling instant global reach for our customers. That's it from my part today. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to reach out or get in touch with us, this is our um, uh, contact information. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Latifa, for the presentation and the potential opportunities that are available here in the uh, real estate tech sector. And we will talk a little bit more on that as well. We'll take some questions. Just a reminder uh, to uh, input your questions on Slido. Uh, so slido.com and uh, hashtag global tech. Uh, and we will be able to uh, review and compile them uh, towards the end of the session. Um, now I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Mr. Ali Kawaja, who is the senior instructor and startup mentor at the American University of Sharjah. Uh, Ali's primary teaching areas are in business information systems, fundamentals of management and operations management. And as a passionate educator, he also mentors startups. He is passionate about entrepreneurship, in startup incubation, technology blockchain, Internet of Things, and mobile app development. Some of the certification he holds are with ICF, Cryptocurrency Certification Consortium, IBM, Microsoft, and Google. And over the course of the years, he has done several uh, courses with London Business School, Princeton, and Stanford. It's a pleasure to have you here with us, Ali. Oh, thank you kindly for the introduction. I hope you guys can hear me clearly. Yes, All we right. can. I'll, uh, fantastic. I'll just I'll jump right into it. I'll get started. Um, as I was just introduced, my name is Ali. I'm with the American University of Sharjah. I spent a lot of time looking forward into the future to see where things are, where things are going, what potentially, you know, are the opportunities that we get presented with. So, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys have already seen or heard in the news the, uh, about chat GBT and I think this is kind of the first tipping point of where I can comfortably say that AI is really here, front and center for all of us to use. Um, the slides I'm using today are very interesting. This is perhaps the first time in my life that I have not significantly contributed to creating the slides. I've had the AI do most of the work for me. <clears throat> the image on the right side of the slide is generated by AI on the caption, the large corpus of text data. The, Question on the left is, you know, how would you explain what ChatGBT is? And that paragraph has come straight out of ChatGBT itself to explain what it is. For those who are not familiar, um, it's, it's an open AI platform that relies on large volumes of data to be able to extrapolate and answer questions in a conversational style. So unlike Google, where you put in the prompt and you hit search and something pops up, this is very conversational. Um, so I'm just going to run you through a couple of things, and I want to kind of spend a little bit more time on where the potential opportunities are. So before we get into that, advantages and disadvantages of AI platforms such as ChatGBT. The first is it's accurate based on the data that you put into it, and it will give you near human-like responses. has huge range of applications. It's limited only by our creativity as humans to see where we can potentially use it and what we can do with it. <clears throat> but the two key things that I have been uh, experiencing, and this is what I have also been explaining to people at different, uh, different workshops and talks, is time saving. So you need to look at these AI tools as not necessarily a replacement of specific job functions, but an advancement of said job functions. It will free up time to do more work that is creative, more work that requires, uh, you know, analytical perspectives and these sort of things, which is where the AI really can't support you. But in the areas that it can, it ultimately results in huge cost savings. Um, if you look at the image on the right, the prompt was advantages of AI poster, 
future on wall in office. It gave me something nice looking, but if you look carefully, you realize that the text is not actually even text. It's just, it's, it's nonsense. So there are limitations. So there's a lot of people who look at it and they fear that, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? AI is going to take over. We're not going to have jobs anymore. We're not going to have anything anymore. It's not, as, it's not as amazing as you might initially think. If we look at the disadvantages, you know, even though I just said that it's highly accurate, it's accurate, but it's limited on its understanding. It does not have contextual awareness. It does not have common sense like human beings would. If I was to hold something and then I say, okay, I'm gonna remove my hand, whatever I'm holding is gonna fall down because I have a contextual and common sense understanding of how gravity works. AI doesn't have that. Um, it's going to have biases. This is this is the age old thing. As soon as we got into data, we you know we have that garbage in garbage out type of scenario. So the limitation of the platform is based on the information that is fed into it. Having said that, I'm being a little critical now. Currently, if memory serves me correct, um, Chat GBT and OpenAI are operating with about 400 million data points. This is going to be very soon expanded to 100 trillion data points. And that difference in itself is going to be tremendous. Aside from the fact that it is a learning engine, so the more the people are using it, the more it learns, the better it gets. Uh, the last article I read said that uh, these guys are spending about $2 million a day in expenses to operate the platform. And it's only been two or three days since they launched the paid version, uh, which is not even a lot, it's $20 a month, which is, which is nothing. Um, so I had already mentioned the lack of creativity simply because it cannot understand what it's doing uh, and the dependence on large volumes of data. Now, the reason why these things are important to, to consider and to think about is you need to have a fundamental understanding of how these systems work. We call it artificial intelligence. The same, same terminology I use when I say artificial grass. You know, if I have a yard, I can plant real grass or I can put artificial grass. And if I plant artificial grass, I can call it fake grass also, the same way I can call this fake intelligence. So it isn't actual intelligence, it's simulating intelligence. And this is, the, I think, the key takeaway that everybody needs to have in order to understand it. Now, um, what are the areas of business that most likely are going to get impacted? Almost everything is going to get impacted directly or indirectly. There's, there's no way around it. You cannot stop it. You cannot pause this you're definitely gonna have huge applications and impact to customer service and marketing and HR. Uh, Latifa in the earlier talk mentioned about what would be really great to have as a customer service tool where you know, clients could communicate. Applications to supply chain for technology have always been around. Even when blockchain came about, the first use cases were in the supply chain industry. I'm very excited actually to see healthcare in the financial sector. In healthcare, majority of inquiries that doctors and hospitals deal with um, are non-critical. So if we can have, for example, an online platform that can have a conversation with a, with a user, um, not, not Google question answer, right? Conversation. You explain the symptoms, you get asked a question, you answer the question, and you go through a handful of questions until the AI, based on its repository of information, can say, okay, looks like you probably have just a clue or just a, just a cold, or you probably have something very simple. Here is a recommended um, dosage of, you know, over-the-counter type of medication. Prescription was sent to your nearby pharmacy. And at the same time, it could escalate and say, okay, look, this seems to be significantly more serious. We're going to make an appointment with a specialist, and now you can go over there. Financial services is very important. We are seeing, you know, uh, move into digital currencies and not even going to touch the crypto part yet but just the move from traditional fiat paper-based currencies into the conversion of digital currencies with apple pay and all of these things getting super normalized uh, and international and global movement of people and money as well as investments uh, and again i'm ping back to latifa's talk where she talked about aml and kyc if we can get ai to optimize a lot of these processes this will be an absolute lifesaver so what can you do with AI today to take advantage of it? So all the, all the things that I just mentioned that's going to have impact, those are the things that you need to think about and say, okay, what are the solutions that I can build on top of it? Obviously, customer service automation type of things. 
you know, optimizing your sales and marketing type of things are definitely there. Talk just right now about uh, financial market fraud detection and these sort of things. Where I really think a lot of stuff that can be built out and done now is on, for example, employee efficiency. How can we upskill and train our employees to do their jobs better and faster and more efficiently? Uh, predictive analytics is something that's going to come in when we start throwing a lot of data into the mix and utilizing the AI to come back and say, okay, you know what? This looks like you might be headed towards trouble. Let's adjust this. And this also takes part, uh, this also is part of the risk management strategy. A lot of decision support systems are also going to come into play, just so you understand how these sort of things integrate. So we see a lot of potential um, for not just changing the way things are done, but also to be able to develop new things that can potentially be utilized by market. Here's a ridiculous example of a question that I threw into uh, chat GBT and it gave me a, a very, very decent answer. From an academic's perspective, it was very brilliantly written out. Um, what I'm gonna do is share this slide for a second. For those of you who have your phones, you can take it out, you can scan the QR code. Over the last few months, I have put together my cheat sheet of AI resources. And the reason I bring this up is we do not only have ChatGBT, that's the one that's been catching the news. There's tons and tons of AI resources. In addition to these standalone AI platforms and resources that provide you so many services, you also have the AI that is gonna get integrated into the tools you are already using. We know, for example, Microsoft has put $10 billion into OpenAI and ChatGBT. They are going to be integrating it into everything, into Excel, into Word, into PowerPoint. Everything you can think that they have in terms of platform is going to have AI integration into it. You can be typing an Excel equation and say, well, I don't know what this does. How can we do it better? It'll pop it up. Or, or given the predictive nature of how it can work, it will give you the recommendation based on just looking at what the data is. Now, always keep in mind, it doesn't have true intelligence behind it. It's just a, you know, a souped up calculator at some point, which has access to a ridiculous sum of data. Um, that's pretty much it for me. Um, feel free to reach out. My handle's on the screen. And thank you for the opportunity, guys. Thank you very much, uh, Ali, for uh, this presentation. Also very relevant. Um, uh, particularly in the financial sector, the, the announcement uh, from the UAE Central Bank uh, on the new central bank digital currency. Um, so we'll, we'll return to that uh, as well uh, later on in the Q&A uh, and how that may be also uh, uh, part of the, the AI uh, developments. Um, just a reminder on Slido, uh, gl uh, hashtag global tech, uh, please send your questions through. Uh, I would like now to introduce our next uh, panelist, so uh, Anusha Iqbal. Uh, Anusha has over 14 years experience in the investment banking and alternative asset management. Uh, she is currently CEO of uh, Spotty, the MENA region's leading shop now pay later platform. Prior to co-founding uh, Spotty, Anusha served as managing director at the Abraj Group, where she oversaw the investment office function at the firm. She joined Abraj in 2007 as a member of the investment team and was uh, responsible for evaluating investment opportunities across MENA and South, South Asia region as well. Prior to joining Abraj, uh, Anusha worked with uh, Dresdner uh, Kleinhort in New York as an analyst in the media group and work, working on mergers and acquisitions um, and film financing projects. Pleasure to have you with us, Anusha. Thank you, Munir, um, and thank you to Australian AII for, uh, AIIA for having um, me on this panel today. Um, I think I'm going to take a lot of what Ali talked about and one take a deep dive into one use case uh, as to how uh, what is happening in the world of technology is shaping how businesses operate. Um, so hopefully everybody can see my screen. Um, I hope you guys can all see that. Um, my name is, uh, as uh, Muni mentioned, Anusha. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of a business called Spotty here in the MENA region. 
uh, we do, and um, given that I'm talking to an audience in, in Australia, I'm sure you're very, very familiar with the concept of buy now, pay later. Um, we call it shop now, pay later. Effectively, uh, in 2020, so about three years ago, uh, I convinced my co-founder to move out of, uh, out of San Francisco uh, and come to the UAE to uh, bring the concept of a buy now, pay later to this part of the world. Uh, and the reason we did that was because this, uh, the GCC, UAE, and Saudi particularly uh, have an extremely young population that is very, that's effectively digitally native. Um, and they are open and willing to try new things very quickly. Um, they're they, uh, this is a great uh, place uh, to get young consumers to embrace new products uh, just because of the way that the entire ecosystem has been developing and growing. Um, BNPL is, a, is part of the embedded finance world. Embedded finance, as you guys know, is something that has, you know, in some shape or form, probably been around for uh, a long time. You, you, you've seen it with uh, retailers offering some version of a credit card or um, uh, financing of appliances uh, or even the auto loans at dealerships. But the reason that today the world of embedded finance is changing actually is a lot of what Ali was talking about, which is uh, using the information that's out there, the big data, and having that really drive a lot of these use cases. Um, and what's happening now is that embedded finance is going to change the way that uh, we as users shop. It's going to change the way that merchants engage with its consumers. Uh, and all of that is going to be driven by, uh, by technology. Um, there, uh, there are a number of different ways uh, that it can be used. Uh, it, they, you have uh, on the left, you see, you know, it can be used, traditional retailers use it, software bases, marketplaces, telecoms, OEMs, anyone who, who basically uh, has a platform which uh, brings a customer or wants to offer them uh, so, uh, something that is financial related, but they themselves are non-financial uh, entity. Uh, and so we're seeing that amalgamation of non-financial services and financial services come together quite uh, quite neatly. Uh, with MySpace, and, and you can see there's, there's a number of different use cases here. It's movement of money, it's keeping up deposits, it's, but what we found very interesting is on the lending side, both secured and unsecured lending. Um, and I think that's where uh, the universe of BNPL comes into play. Uh, particularly sitting out of Australia, I'm sure you, know, you guys constantly hear the, the words BNPL, but it remains one of the, uh, it still remains extremely underpenetrated and remains to be one of the fastest growing payment methods over the next five years. And this is globally. Uh, these stats are probably even more stark uh, when it comes to the uh, to the GCC region. Um, whilst buy, buy now pay later has been around in some of the other markets, such as Australia and the US, um, since the early 2020s, uh, here it, you know it's only it's very nascent. Um, there are a handful of players that are that are uh, that have launched in market, and very rapidly the adoption. Uh, we are very we're seeing this adoption very rapidly but uh, there's still a lot of um, a room to grow. Uh, you know, there, even for a very young, for a small population, within uh, the last six months, we've had 5 million consumers uh, in the MENA region use BNPL. Um, and what does that do? Why do people use it? People use it to help them uh, budget, to help them manage their everyday spending. And from a merchant's perspective, it helps them Capture their consumers in a uh, in a much more deeper and engaged manner, um, and that's uh, a large part of that journey. Also goes back to the, to the technological advancements uh, that Ali was referring to. You, there's a lot of um, uh, communication and engagement with the consumers using those technologies. Uh, as I said, it is one of the fastest growing payment methods uh, globally, and Initially, the assumption was it was being used by uh, by 
by Gen Zers or the younger generation. But what we're seeing here out in the region is that pretty much all demographics use it. Uh, and it's actually something that's used by all income levels. And the reason that that's the case is because it's a fairly, uh, what, is, what is the key USB? It's easy onboarding, it's easy to use, and it embeds, as the word embedded finance says, it embeds itself in the day-to-day -day, uh, uses of, um, uh, of the consumer. Uh, so if I were to go back and say, well, how, how are we leveraging technology uh, to, um, to do this? You know, there's, there's an application, you download it. The first step here, you know, verifying information, verifying who you are as, as, a, as a user. Uh, for us, a lot of that is done uh, by understanding uh, uh, not just your, um, your your demographic information, which we are able to capture through your national ID, but also your digital footprint. Also, uh, you know where are you coming from? What are you going to be buying uh, as a consumer? Uh, so you know that really helps prevent fraud uh, and it helps verify the authenticity of a customer that's coming on board. Um, and then the more interesting part of this is the decisioning. Using the information uh, that we're able to get in effectively as you come through this online journey, which happens in minutes, how much credit can you take? What, uh, how much, what should be your spend capacity coming in uh, into the platform? So if you are a good user um, and we are able to identify what it is that you're purchasing, then uh, we are also able to see how much should you be given? There's definitely uh, a lot of, there's definitely a lot of users who would, um, uh, you know, may, may want to be purchasing more than what they can spend, uh, but, uh, but we don't want that on the platform because we wanna be able to ensure um, you, you're, you know, you're spending responsibly. And then finally, uh, an environment or an ecosystem where you can find things to shop. But here also, you know, there's a way of understanding the consumer's behavior and then engaging with them for things that are meaningful for them to be buying. So across the board in this BNPL journey, you'll notice there's a, there's a lot of data and a lot of analytics that goes on in the background uh, that effectively is used to help engage, uh, engage those users in a much more meaningful way. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, and uh, give it back to Munir. And uh, hopefully that was uh, interesting. Thank you very much, uh, Anusha. Very, very interesting indeed. And there are a, lot, a number of questions on Slido that we will uh, get to shortly. Um, our next speaker uh, is Kokila uh, Alak, who is um, the founder of CARM Legal uh, Consultants. And Kokila is a corporate commercial uh, and technology lawyer with over 17 years of experience in the Middle East region. Uh, she has worked with major corporations, government and semi-government entities, high net worth individuals and startups over the years. Um, owing to her core strength as an ardent corporate commercial lawyer with a strong financial service and technology background, um, her strong entrepreneurial skills and formidable experience in the region as both a lawyer and an entrepreneur, she established Calm Legal as a boutique uh, law firm. Calm uh, provides legal advice on fintech, blockchain, uh, currency, data protection, and uh, other tech-related uh, advice. Um, Kakila has been nominated in various awards and named among the Asian Legal Business Super 50 Lawyers in MENA uh, 2022. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here with us, uh, Kokila, to talk to us about doing business uh, in the region and particularly in the UAE. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, very excited to talk about. So I, I must say that this morning for us has been very interesting listening to all these texts which are doing phenomenally well in the United States, uh, sorry, in the United Arab Emirates. Interestingly, what I would like to talk about, why would you want to come to UAE specifically? And not just UAE, let's talk about GCC. So just to add a little bit more to my introduction, I came to Dubai as a fresh law graduate from Monash, Melbourne uh, in, 2004, in 2004. And since then, I have seen the legal landscape really evolving around what is 
what needs to be done to attract more expats and more FBI to the country and to the region across. So we've seen the legal framework evolve, uh, making it more lucrative, easier for anybody from any nationality, from any part of the world in any sector to come and set up shop here. So let's start here. Uh, so today we're going to focus only on UAE, though Karm, uh, my law firm now has offices across the region, but let's talk about what's home ground for us here. So interestingly, as I said, uh, so UAE, you know, it comprises of seven Emirates, uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi being the most popular one that you hear of. And all these Emirates have their own laws, but we do have a federal legal structure that over encompasses all of those. Now, in the year 2003, 2004, just about the time when I moved here, the, the federal authorities decided to have these multiple free trade zones. And these free trade zones were set up mainly to allow expats to come here, set up business, and get all the different benefits which were specially designed for them. Now, we started with those, then we moved on to creating specific financial free zones. Now, interestingly, we're going to talk more about it, that why a need for financial free zones was there, mainly because uh, we're a civil law, civil law based country. And we realized as a country that more of these business structures that we're looking for, especially for investments, are more common in common law principles. So with that, DIFC was set up, uh, Dubai International Financial Center and ADGM. I'm going to talk more about that in my next slides. So interestingly, as I said, that UAE is divided into certain segments. And it's very interesting that we have what we call a mainland license. So if a company was to set up here and start providing services, just for, say, the local population of UAE, then it's most ideal for you to set up your shop or your business in mainland UAE. Now, mainland UAE means that you're outside the free trade zone, but providing your services across to all UAE residents and uh, the global world. And free trade zones specifically provide services or products or selling your products out, mainly focused outside UAE, but using the beneficial structures that UAE provides. Now, way back in 2004, 2005, these were very strong differences. Now, I say they were very strong and now no more is because of what changes have happened in the law for the last 17, 18 years and 2022 and 2020 being the major changes. Another thing, interestingly, that one needs to keep in mind when you're looking at setting up business in this part of the world and specifically in UAE, you really need to know your business. So from day one, you need to identify that this is the service or this is the product or business that I want to do, mainly because every company needs to have an identified activity as a part of its trade license. So unlike the rest of the world where you first go and set up an LLC or an LLP and then identify what this company is going to do, in UAE, it's the other way around. You first have to identify what service because every company has a specific objective. So on your memorandum and articles or your trade license or your certificate of registration, along with your name, you would have the details of what business are you gonna do. Now, so that's why we mostly advise our clients that determine your business activity, map out your target customers. Do you wanna offer your services to retail clients based in mainland UAE? Or you wanna do more global business? so that you could be in a free zone or you need to be in the mainland. Identify preferred business location. Now, where do you want to go set up your shop? Do you want to be in Buzzing Dubai? You want to be in Abu Dhabi? Or you want to be in any of the Northern Emirates across? You need to know clearly day one itself. And identify business owners. We do not encourage or we do not have legal system for bearer shares where a company set up and later on you bring in your shareholders or the owners. From day one itself, you need to know who are going to be the UBOs as well as the shareholders in this company and also a certain end goals. So you need to know, are you looking at expanding your big business across Asia and use UAE as a hub? 
or you're going to use your entities based here to spread your business across the MENA region or just the GCC. Now, why is that important? Because this helps you planning up from day one the type of business that you would like to set up. Now, just briefly to talk about the commercial companies law, which is a uh, federal law number 2015, and also the civil code are the main driving uh, laws behind all the mainland entities that are based in UAE. Now, as I said, this has already been covered. You need to know your business activity. You need to know your legal form. What's going to be the name of the company? Interestingly, every free zone or mainland requires you to give them three to four options, and they come back to you what they would approve of. So it cannot be randomly deciding ABC and say, from, my, from tomorrow, this is my name. All these approvals. Now, this sounds like a very lengthy process, but because of use of AI and the whole vision of the country to move to the whole web 3.0 space all this is digital and done almost instantly these are the different types of companies that you could set it up here so mainly most of the trading companies so if you're a hardware tech trading company you would most likely go for a limited liability structure or if you are going to be say uh, you're already an established business doing really well you could set up as yourself as a branch or a rep office here and start with that business. Or you could be uh, just a professional providing your services. So it, like we have a lot of clients who moved here and provide blockchain as a technology. So your bus services or your SaaS services could be from a civil company structure. And all these are pretty easy to understand. Uh, so this is just in details talking about what limited liability companies can do. Now, interestingly, one more fact that you should know about is that unlike anywhere else, even though the shared capital uh, mentioned under the law that there is a requirement of a minimum shared capital, um, more often than not, we do not see any of the free zones or even from mainland actually seeing you physically injecting that beta capital. So it needs to be more documented rather than a physical evidence of you paying that capital. And why most of the companies would like to go for a rep office or a branch is firstly, you have the brand and you're already an existing business. It's also the fact that before the amendment that came out in 2020, mainland UAE companies had a mandatory requirement of a majority shareholder being a UAE national. So irrespective of what your profit sharing structure could be, in equity, you needed a UAE national holding at least 51% shares in the company. Now that has been completely repealed. We no longer require that. And now that has created uh, all of, almost all of a sudden uh, clients who were initially you know, just wanting to be in a free zone because they did not want a UAE national to be a majority shareholder shifting their businesses to mainland because the benefits are the same, be it in a free trade zone or mainland, which is a lot more, uh, it's a wider community because you can have your showrooms or your offices in mainland UAE. Uh, and sorry, just to mention for a branch of a foreign company, which we see a lot of tech companies doing it here, you do not need a UAE national or a UAE partner. However, you still need a UAE national to be working with you as a local service agent and helping you with all government and regulatory compliances. Uh, again, what we see is that, especially for a tech service provider, you have different options by which you start your business here. Now, one could be pure licensing models that we look at. Uh, one could be straight away, and we've recently been a part of it. Uh, for one of the Australian companies to get into a public-private partnership model with the government, where it's it's a it's a project driven and run by one of the government authorities and the tech service providers are partners with them and and then. so these models are getting more and more popular in the last ten years. We see many of these coming out. Um, the other would be a joint venture, so you could be providing a technology, merging it with B, and A B together could form a JV structure here. Or the last one could be that you look at a pure, simple franchising model. The laws support all these models pretty well, well across UAE. And talking about free Thank zone. Thank you so much. Uh, 
Apologies, Kokila, to interrupt. We're just uh, on time because we do have to uh, to run for the other parts of the sessions. Um, sure. That was very useful. And we will, of course, share your details and the presentation with the attendees. Um, as, as we previously mentioned, this is more of a, uh, a, a webinar just to uh, share some of the opportunities. And, yeah. and of course, there will be follow up conversations with all the companies uh, to make sure that we, uh, we can promote uh, even in more detail and provide them the advice. Uh, so I really yeah. thank you for your time, uh, Kokila. Um, very interesting uh, what you mentioned there, Kokila, as well, in terms of uh, specific to the tech companies and some of the setups and the options available uh, where, you know, we, we would look, for example, from a limited liability company or whether it's from a, uh, uh, you know, a subsidiary. Um, looking at the startups environment and uh, looking at the potential here uh, in the United Arab Emirates in particular, but also across the GCC, uh, what, what are some of the pitfalls uh, from a registration perspective that you would provide as advice to companies to avoid or to prepare for, uh, particularly if they are a startup that are just looking to come to the market and access the ecosystem here? Uh, just maybe, you know, top two, top two sure. recommendations that you'd provide. So one of the main advices would be to look around the market because there are many incentives being given by governments across GCC for all startups. So you could, you need to do your homework thoroughly well because some of these incentive programs do have an equity in which, and it's a substantial equity that either of the, like the accelerators or incubators are running. So please do your homework really well. Second, be very mindful of where would you want the intellectual property or the IP rights of your tech to be sitting? Would you want that to be under the UAE legal structure or if you're in Qatar or in Saudi, or if you're an Australian company and you've got a global product, where would you want these? So, so those are some of the hard negotiations that we advise our tech startups to always look at. Thank you, uh, Kokila. Um, just looking at the Slido questions uh, at the moment, we do have a question for uh, Ali. We have a couple of questions that I don't think we'll get the chance to cover all of them. However, we will uh, try to cover as much as possible. Um, Ali, just a quick question for you in terms of uh, the ICT spend and the link with research, research funding. Um, obviously, from a Saudi Arabia perspective, they're spending around 30, they spent around $33 billion um, in 2022 uh, in the ICT infrastructure. The UAE around $23 billion by, by this year, and Qatar, of course, projected to spend around $9 billion. Where do you see that sort of flow on effect, particularly on research? Um, and, and where can uh, Australian entities, for example, uh, access that uh, ecosystem to, to work on pilot projects or present their capabilities? So um, what we're seeing, um, and, I'll, and I'll speak specific to the UAE, and then you can extrapolate that Saudi is growing, but just at a larger scale, because it's just, it's just bigger and more money there. Um, we're seeing huge investments and initiatives coming out of government. They're, they really want to push towards the knowledge-based economy. And, and they understand to be future forward. You know, Dubai's had a blockchain policy before countries even, other countries even knew what blockchain was. We just had an announcement come out of Sheikh Mohammed's office at one of his meetings where he's like, we need to look into how, for example, ChatGBT is going to help government and all these sort of things. So there's lots of initiatives that are coming out of there. There's many, many uh, incubators that are government funded in the country, out of Abu Dhabi, out of Dubai, even out of Sharjah, um, that do work in conjunction with universities. Um, you know, I'm at the American University of Sharjah, and we have a separate research budget that comes from government directly to set up research centers and explore a lot of things. So we're seeing everything kind of finally come together, I want to say. We've got the educational sector pushing in. We've got the funding from government coming to education for research, and we have it coming from incubators. So it's it's a, it's a very very good time to visit and and see how the space is developing, picking up. Thank you very much, Ali. And and speaking of announcements, uh, I think Sheikh Mohammed also just announced yesterday uh, the Dubai flying taxi stations to be operational in three years' yes. time, which is which is incredible. I, I've seen them at the Dubai RTA. Obviously, the 
at the prototype, but uh, yeah, looking forward to uh, to looking at the implementation. Uh, we do have a question for Anusha as well. Um, if uh, apologies, Latifa had to leave us earlier, but uh, again, we will refer to Ali if there's any more question uh, for Latifa, uh, because Ali also is is a board member of Baituki, so he'll be able to to answer any questions on that. Um, just a question for Anusha, though. In the meantime, um, are there opportunities for digital payment providers to collaborate with large businesses in the UAE market? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I think one of the interesting things that have been happening, um, and it's also the way that we have been operating, is that you're getting a lot of uh, fintechs coming up that want to actually grow the broader ecosystem. So even if I look at our business, right, uh, we we collaborate with a digital payment provider on one aspect of our business. We collaborate with a EKYC provider on another aspect of our business. Uh, we collaborate with a um, AI-based uh, marketing company on, on a different part of our business, right? So uh, overall, the interesting part is that this is a very young uh, ecosystem that is open for a lot of collaboration. Um, so you and and the other the other thing that we found uh, in this market is that you actually end up with a lot of large corporates that are now, and I mean now in the most recent past of say two, three years, have started to see the value of uh, fast changing, forward thinking, small businesses uh, coming in and adding a lot more value to their larger corporations. Um, you know, so uh, the BNPL space is a good example of that where uh, we partner with large retailers to provide that service for them as opposed to the historically where they've been like, we can build this in house. Uh, so very long-winded answer to say yes. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you very much, Anusha. Uh, look, we have only three minutes left. I'm just conscious of everyone's time, um, but we will be uh, accessible, of course, and contactable following this uh, fantastic webinar. Uh, we'll share the details shortly. Uh, Mani, if you can load up the, the rest of the slides and then we can go through them. Um, just remember, support is available uh, through Austrade here. Uh, we are on the ground. Um, we can, of course, connect you with uh, our speakers and other stakeholders in the market. Today was more of a snapshot of the opportunities. We can talk for hours on, on what's happening here and uh, going through some of these uh, priorities. Uh, please, as a point of contact, please feel free to reach out to Rohan Malhotra, who is the Senior Business Development Manager that's looking after technology here. And of course, to myself, our emails are on the slide. Uh, pr primarily from an action perspective, though, and, and something that Ali and Anusha uh, and uh, Cochlea and uh, Latifa had referred to, is more to be present in the market and come and visit us. So there are a number of uh, activities that will be running the Dubai FinTech Summit in May, uh, JITEX uh, in October, and of course COP28, the Conference of the Parties of the UN. Uh, and this is all about the cross sector of technology with other sectors. Uh, more than happy to brief you further on this. Uh, please get in touch and we will answer your questions as well that we couldn't cover on Slido. Over to you, Marnie and Simon. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Munir, and, th and thank you to all of our fantastic speakers today. Uh, it's really clear that from everything from fintech uh, apps and property tech and chat GPT and AI implementations all the way through to flying taxis, uh, there's a huge opportunity in this rapidly changing and evolving region, and it's really exciting for our Australian tech businesses. So thank you very much to our speakers. Um, as I mentioned at the top, this has been our final uh, web our final webinar in this series. Uh, and we would like to thank our partners at AIIA for their ongoing support, as well as the teams behind the scenes, of course, and our audience today and throughout the series. If you have missed any of our uh, webinars that you'd like to take a look at or, or go back and rewatch, uh, they are available from our export.business.gov.au webpage. That brings us to the end today. Uh, I'll pass back to Simon to close. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, Marnie. Thank you to all the wonderful panellists who gave up their time to uh, present the opportunities and the innovation that is taking place in the, in, in the UAE and the Gulf, across the Gulf. And um, I assume that the the, uh, the flying taxis, you know, I was in 
uh, Silicon Valley in May, and uh, I thought they were advanced with their self-driving cars all over the roads in pilot mode. But uh, uh, I think Dubai's got it over them, over Silicon Valley. So that's wonderful. Thanks again to Austrade. Um, hope everyone enjoyed it. Love the relationship and uh, see you again next time.